Good afternoon and good evening. This is Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. And today we have the very first in our special series. We're going to be trying to introduce a patient, a TOS patient, and let her tell her story. So I want to introduce Jen Hine. Jen, thank you so much for volunteering to share with us. And I very much look forward to hearing your story. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Take it from the beginning. So uh, do a little intro just about myself. Uh, my name is Jen. I'm, I'm going to be referencing my notes because I have brain fog like everyone else with chronic pain. Um, I am 41 years old and I've had TOS for about five and a half years. I have it bilaterally, so on both sides. My left side is kind of my, what I call my bad side. Um, I live up in Northern California and I love the ocean. I love my plants, especially succulents, uh, my three cats. I love walking around my neighborhood, taking walks at the beach, playing with my nephew, spending time with family and friends. Um, and I also wanted to add that I also do have scoliosis. I have an S curve, which does contribute to the severity of my TOS. And I also have CRPS from, um, I believe from the first surgery I had. So that's kind of a little intro about me. What year did you first start having symptoms? In 2016. And oddly enough, it was actually on uh, rare disease day which is the last day of February. So appropriate. I woke up with a migraine and a really stiff neck and, you know, some nerve pain in my arm and hand, which I didn't recognize as nerve pain at the time because I really hadn't had it before. Um, I had extreme pain in my upper traps. It was like somebody just yanked it so tight that was one of my worst symptoms. And I mean, still kind of to today, it gets very tight. I have a lidocaine patch on it and it just kind of pulls everything. Um, a lot of tightness and I just had a lot of pain, like general pain in this area. Um, that's kind of how it came on. And it literally came on overnight. I'm a hairstylist or I was a hairstylist of about 13 and a half years. I was running my own salon. I was definitely working too much. And, but yeah, I woke up one day and I just couldn't do, I literally woke up and couldn't do my job, couldn't really do anything. It was really crazy. So did you go into work that day or the next couple of days, John? No, actually this was on a Sunday and hairstylists always take Sundays and Mondays off. Right. So I was supposed to actually go see my family that day, but I had to cancel. And then the next day I went to a chiropractor that a friend of mine had recommended, excuse me. Um, I have a local chiropractor who I love and I've been going to for probably about seven years, but he was busy and I needed to get in because, you know, I needed to get back to work and back to my life. So I wanted to get this handled because I thought, oh, it's just my neck. I'll go get adjusted a few times and I'll be back to work. Ha ha ha. Um, so she was doing, she was doing really intense and kind of violent adjustments on me. Um, things that looking back were definitely counterproductive for TOS. Um, and of course she kept telling me like, oh, you'll be back to work at the end of the week. So I just kept kind of rescheduling clients and rescheduling clients and it felt horrible to have to tell people over and over, I'm sorry, but now I still can't come in. And I didn't know what was going on. So I couldn't say I have this problem. So, you know, so the chiropractor never said, you know, I think you've got muscle strains or a neck sprain, never came up with a diagnosis. Mm -mm. Eventually, did you think about so that I at the time her. or did you just kind of leave yourself in the hands of the chiropractor? Well, I went to her for about three months and about two months in, I said, look, we need to figure out what's wrong. And I've been doing my own research at this point. I said, maybe I have a bulging disc. Like, is it worth getting an MRI? And she said, oh, okay, yeah, let's do that. And then when it came back, I had like a one millimeter bulge at, I believe my C5, C6, which technically isn't a big enough to mean anything to anybody. So at that point she was clueless to what happened to me. And she told me that she took my x-rays and my case and talked to a bunch of top chiropractors and nobody could come up with anything. 
which makes me think she probably didn't do that. Um, and so after, you know, three months of this, I just had had enough. So I went back to my original chiropractor. I was able to get in. And it, within about five minutes of him talking to me, he said, I think you might have this thing called thoracic outlet syndrome. And who is this chiropractor, if you don't mind using his name? Not at all. His name is Dr. Kenneth Thomas. He's here in Pacifica, and he's a wonderful man. He knows you a lot about the You mentioned system. him before to me, and you always speak very well of him. So I guess that was fortunate that you went back to him. Absolutely. I'm really grateful that I did that. Yeah. So he so said TOS, and that was the first time you had ever heard of it, I'm sure. I had never heard of it. So I went home and, you know, started researching and trying to find out what was going on. And it just was like, wow, this is exactly what's happening to me. After, you know, this was probably, this was in June, so maybe three or four months after my symptoms had started. So, um, so when you started reading about it, what did you think? Were you surprised? Did, did you think it was something weird and rare? I definitely thought it was something weird and rare. I'd never heard of it. And when you look it up, it says, I don't know if it says very rare or just rare. I believe it said it was like one in 200,000 people or something like that. Um, but I just, I'd never heard of it and I didn't know anybody else who had it at that just time. Just for, for the sake of our audience, do you believe now that it's rare? No. no. Do you believe it's uh, underdiagnosed, underrecognized, and maybe diagnoses are delayed? Massively, yes. I think a lot of people have this, um, whether it's, you know, very, um, like the symptoms are very little and maybe it's just escalated at certain times. Other people have it really bad. There's, there's a big spectrum of the way people, you know, feel when they have this, whether they have symptoms in their arm or just up here. And so it's a really, it's a big. Great point. Very variable yeah. in different people, variable within one patient at different times of the day. Absolutely. Different times of the week. Very, very good point. We're going to discuss a little bit later why you know so much about different patients. But <laughs> let's go back to when you saw Dr. Thomas. He said, I think this is TOS. What was the plan at that point? So at that point, I called my primary care physician um, because he said, you need to get in, you need to see a doctor and probably start going to physical therapy. So I called. Um, I called my primary and I said, look, I need to get in. And so the first thing was they sent me to um, an orthopedic specialist because even though I had said the thing is TOS, my doctor had to Google that. And so, you know, at first everybody thought it was my neck. It's got to be your neck. You're having symptoms down your arm. It's got to be your neck. I mean, I heard this for probably 16 months. Um, I went to the orthopedic specialist. She couldn't find anything. Um, I had, like, I got a cervical and thoracic MRI and just, they couldn't find anything. So at that point, um, I was sent to a vascular specialist at Stanford. May I interrupt for one second? I hope you don't mind my interruptions. No. It's just that you, you have a lot of detail in your story and you bring up some really interesting side paths and I'm trying to draw threads that match some other people's experiences. When you had the cervical spine and thoracic spine MRI and they came back negative, how did your doctor react? What was their plan? First of all, they said, well, it's great news. We didn't find anything. And to me, that wasn't great news. Um, and because like, because Dr. Thomas had said COS, they're like, well, let's get you in to a TOS specialist so that we can roll that in or out kind of thing. Good. So they didn't quit. That's a good thing. No. Well, I wasn't going to let them quit. I was, I was very much determined to get to the bottom of this. We have heard stories from lots of patients that they'll get back some imaging studies and their doctor will start saying, look, you know, uh, not finding anything, you know, maybe you just need to relax. I'm sure you've heard that story too. Uh, it's just very good that your personality being the way it is that uh, either you wouldn't let your doctors quit or they didn't. But I'm very glad to hear that they say, we don't know what's going on. We'll find you somebody. So yeah. That's, yeah. that's good. Yeah, definitely. I, I got lucky there. I have a really good primary care physician. 
Um, and I think that, that helps a lot because she's kind of the gatekeeper to my care. Mm -hmm. It's very important. It is very important because often with TOS, we have so many different specialists pitching in, you know, and they deal with this little corner of the world that so few people deal with. So for your primary care doc to be that intermediary, to put all those opinions together, what I always say is to be the quarterback. That's really, really good for patients. And, and not everybody has a primary care doc like you. Mm -mm, I know, it's really unfortunate. But so back to what you said about you like- referred to a vascular surgeon. Oh, I'm sorry, go well, ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, the thing about, I can tell you that throughout my journey, the medication I've been offered the most is antidepressants because it's constantly, oh, you're depressed, you have anxiety, which is true, but I have anxiety and depression because, because. Of, you know, I got my life yanked away from me overnight. It's not the cause, it's because. Right. Yeah, so at that point, I went to a vascular surgeon at Stanford and um, I told him all my symptoms. And, you know, I didn't have a ton of nerve pain in my arm and hand unless I really exacerbated it. Most of my pain was kind of in my trap and my neck and my shoulder. So he thought based off of that, um, that I didn't have POS. And uh, some other symptoms I was having, I was having migraines. I was having vertigo that I'd never had before, really crazy vertigo. Um, did, did he think those were unrelated to TOS? He said that TOS is only in the arm and hand. And if you don't have symptoms in your arm and hand, and if you have a bunch of symptoms up here, it's not TOS. What do you think about that? Well, I don't think it's true. Um, TOS causes like a chain reaction. It's like a domino effect. One muscle gets upset and then it's like, bing, 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 bing. Everybody wants to come to the party. So, you know, I don't, I, I talk to so many people who have migraines. I've talked to other people who have vertigo from it because things are being compressed and squeezed. And so I just, I don't think that's true. I think, you know, it's, it can be an array of symptoms. Not so everybody can have all those symptoms, but some people for the, will. For the sake of our viewers, I would say that, uh, and this is where I get to speak a little bit because I have a little bit of practice and training. The literature clearly supports what you say, Jen. Headaches are common in TOS patients. Now, headaches are common in general. So just because you have a headache doesn't mean you have TOS. Let's look at it the right way. Right. But I've, I've known patients in a big healthcare system around here who were told you can't have TOS because you have a headache, which is nuts. That's the medical term for it. Uh, it's nuts. I like that. <laughs> dizziness, ringing in the ears occur. And we do believe we have some inklings why. There's a lot of uh, venous drainage that comes out of the head and neck and shoulders and has to pass through the thoracic outlet. And there can be degrees of compression of those veins that lead to a backup in blood. Uh, this right. is actually something that's become more interesting to people over time. There was a doctor in Italy who thought that multiple sclerosis was caused by this backup of, of venous blood flow. Uh, mm. Chronic cerebrospinal venous insufficiency, it's called. There are groups on Facebook about that. And there is some evidence that supports it, although you know, not to the full extent of um, everybody coming out and saying blurred vision is due to it, whatever. But, but it is an, a very interesting mechanism, we believe, it is an effect. A lot of the progressive people in TOS field believe that there is an element of venous compression. And so headaches, uh, ringing in the ears, vertigo, dizziness can occur, even lower extremity symptoms in some TOS patients. And without proof, we're starting to think that because of this impaired abnormal venous drainage, that the spinal cord can be affected. Without going into the anatomy of why that happens, uh, again, um, this doctor who saw you shouldn't have said you don't have TOS, you know, because you have headaches or anything like that. Um, so, so you had already been theoretically diagnosed by your chiropractor, Dr. Thomas, with TOS. And I'm sure when you went to see the vascular surgeon at Stanford, you said, you know, could I have TOS? I'm sure you said that. And um, he did, did he, how much time did he spend with you? How thorough an exam did he do? How did you feel in general? about the way you were treated at that time? Well, he didn't do a physical exam on me. Um, and I know that there are a couple of physical exams because I'd had them done, well, no, I, I've had them done since. But what he said was, I don't think you have TOS, but I think you should go to physical therapy 
for TLS because I think it will help your symptoms. Hmm. So, you know, he just kind of wrote me off to PT and was like, see you later. I didn't feel seen or heard. I felt very dismissed. Um, that's fine. Now that, that's interesting because you had the first chiropractor who didn't give you a diagnosis. You oh. Had this vascular surgeon who didn't give you a diagnosis, but advised treatment. So I, the I vascular that. surgeon, sorry to cut you off, but the vascular surgeon, I asked him, you know, what do you think about me doing acupuncture? What do you think about me, my, my chiropractor? And he said, well, I don't believe in chiropractors. So I kind of left there spinning around like, okay, like, so now what? That's hard. So it's really hard. You know, you go to a doctor to try to get some direction and then, you know, leave right. feeling more confused than ever. Right. It's not great. So you went to physical therapists. Uh, what did they think or what did he or she think? Um, I went to a physical therapist at Stanford and he told me that he didn't think I had true TOS because he had seen it before. And, you know, he kept doing things that were hurting me and telling me like, this shouldn't be hurting you. He was very dismissive again, like told me, oh, you don't have true TOS. He's not a doctor, you know? So I ended up leaving that person because it wasn't helping me. And it was just honestly making me kind of angry at the time. What was the physical therapy making you worse? Is that what you said? That it was hurting you at some point? Hurting me. It was hurting me. It was exacerbating my symptoms all the time. And okay. I mean, TOS is really tough. I feel like with physical therapy, it maybe is going to help you or it's going to really hurt. It's just depending on the physical therapist that you get, their knowledge of TOS and their willingness to kind of you know, go down that journey with you. Sure. Did this physical therapist uh, have experience with TOS or was it just too rare that he had never really just maybe seen it once or twice? Which feeling did you get? Um, the second one. He said he had a bunch of experience, but I don't believe that he did really. Okay. Based off of how he was treating me. Um, I think he thought that there was only one kind of TOS. And I've heard the term true TOS Another time from a neurologist. I don't like it. Um, it's very dismissive. There you go. That's a great yeah. word, Jen. It dismisses a whole population of patients who have the exact same pattern of pain, but they haven't ruined the muscles in their hands yet. Right. And why, why do we wait for that? Nobody, no doctor treats any nerve entrapment saying, well, let's just wait till it gets so serious that it's absolutely proven to me. You know, yeah. it's just a logical fallacy, in my opinion. And obviously you, by this time, had educated yourself enough and you were smart enough to start figuring this out. Yeah. So, um, but you're right. True, true neurogenic TOS just should never be used because the rest, what does that mean? That there's a whole group of fakers I and mean, there's true TOS and there's a bunch of drug seekers. It's right. just dismissive, a great word. So how long did you spend with physical therapy at Stanford and what happened next? Honestly, I don't remember. It couldn't have been more than a couple months. Um, I was going every week, but when it, you know, it was just hurting me and hurting me and hurting me and he wasn't listening to me. Eventually I just I knew I had to leave. Um, and at that point I had been referred to a physiatrist at a pain clinic. Um, who did confirm my TOS by using the Addison, Addison's test and the Ruse test. They're both physical exams for TOS. Mm -hmm. um, and they were both positive for neurogenic TOS. I believe, like you were talking about, I believe I had a little bit of vascular going on too, even though none of my doctors say that. But because of the extreme vertigo I was having and, you know, I don't know if that was just my scaling, squeezing things or what was going on, but um, it was really intense. And so they said, well, look, we have this program, this pain management program. We want you to go through it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, cool. And um, I went for about nine months. It was, um, we did like guided meditation, physical therapy, yoga, art therapy. And the most helpful thing was this pain education class. Sorry, 
where they would teach us about how pain works in the brain, how pain signals are sent. It was really helpful to understand what physically is going on in your body. I really, that's something I like to know. Um, the unfortunate thing about this group was they were really, really anti-surgery. So I, in my mind was like, well, I'm never getting surgery. It's gonna ruin my life. Um, they did give me a lot of tools getting, for getting through flare ups and it was a great group of people, but it was, the group was kind of for people who were kind of at the end of their road, who were at the point where they have to kind of accept that like, they're going to live with this forever. And I was in the very beginning of my journey. So it wasn't really matching up to where I was at. And I had a psychiatrist in the program tell me or try to convince me that my pain was all coming from my childhood trauma. Because one time when I was speaking to him, I said something, something, and then I said my pain and I looked over here and he said, oh, you look right at your pain area. And that means that it just, he was so dismissive. You know, he's like, well, basically he told me this is all in your head. So I didn't go back to him. Um, and I kind of like, they just kept trying to push me towards acceptance, acceptance. And I was like, no, I wanna, I want to get back to work. I want to resolve this. So um, basically, I just had to leave the program. I became unable to go. So over time, I got worse and worse. Um, when I first had TOS, I could still drive. I could still go to the grocery store. I could still, you know, do things for myself. But over time, my pain got worse and I became more and more disabled to the point where I couldn't even be in a car long enough to drive to this place, which was 25 minutes from my house, let alone sit there for the six hours. And um, so I just, I was feeling very lost. Um, I saw a rheumatologist, I saw uh, several other physiatrists and nobody could really, I, although they had said, yes, you have neurogenic TOS, because the physical therapy hadn't worked, they said, well, it must not be that. So they just kept going back and forth, back and forth. So when I left the program, I didn't know what was going on with me. And this was like about 16 months into my pain. Um, luckily, I was referred to have an EMG with somebody who's really good at EMGs at Stanford. And um, she, told me like basically my, my medial antibrachial cutaneous, the MABC nerve was non-responsive. Um, she said that's positive for TOS and she nearly jumped out of her chair. She was so surprised that I had, you know, so she said it's only like one in a thousand people who have severe compression that show this. And at that point I was like, I, I was like, so let's, let's clarify for our listeners. So this is a type of EMG test. And she said, lots of patients come with TOS and one in a thousand have a positive EMG. Is that a fair? I, yeah, I've only met a couple other people in thousands of people that I've met with TOS, hundreds maybe, who have um, tested positive on an EMG. And it's really frustrating for people because that's one of the first tests they send you for, and then it comes back negative. And then people say, well, you must not have TOS, which isn't true. Absolutely so I guess true. I got lucky on that. Absolutely but anyway. true. What'd you say? That's absolutely true. And that mm. is the reason that we have true and disputed TOS. This was this guy, Asa Wilborn at the Cleveland Clinic, guy with a good reputation, but he's the guy who said, if the EMG is negative, you have disputed TOS. Well, he was the only person disputing it, but it became easy for a lot of people who don't know TOS to say, ah, it's disputed. I don't need to spend my time learning all this very difficult anatomy and stuff. So right. it, really, it really sets people back. To this day, we get a lot of physicians who just roll their eyes at TOS. We get yeah. patients all the time from insurance companies who say we're not doing any imaging until we do an EMG first. And you can argue till you're blue in the face, but that is the status quo. And from right. a patient's point of view, if you get a negative EMG, now you have a higher hill to climb to convince your doctor that you have TOS. Right. It's just too easy to dismiss again. So you did have a positive EMG though. What happened after that? 
Well, I, I was like overwhelmed with happiness that this woman finally was like, you solidly have this. And I, I literally started crying. I hugged her. About five minutes later, I started crying because I realized like this is not a good diagnosis to have. And like now what? Because I didn't, I, you know, I, this group had been so anti-surgery. I had already tried physical therapy. So I was feeling like, well, what do I do now? So at that point, um, they were like, well, you need to go back to see the Stanford doctor again now that you have this positive EMG. Because at that point, basically, I have TOS that can't be disputed. Um, uh, he, he was the only vascular surgeon, quote, in my network. So I went back to him. Um, at this point, this was about 16 months after the pain started. I was so in so much pain, I was basically bedridden. Um, I really couldn't do anything. And I was I was being given anti-inflammatories. I was being given nerve pain medication. Mm -hmm. You know, I was offered antidepressants at the time I wasn't taking them, but I was never given pain medication. So I was just really, really suffering to the point where I, I was bedridden and I couldn't do anything. Um, So, sorry, when I went to stop, when I went back to the Stanford doctor, um, he basically said, okay, um, you have TOS and we need to do surgery on you. Excuse me for one second. Of course. My son brought me a drink. Oh, look at you, delivery. They're, they know that I'm up here locked in for some reason. They don't know if it's for good or for evil. <laughs> <laughs> so now you go and see the Stanford doc again, the one who had said, I don't think you have TOS. How did he respond to this new objective information? Well, I mean, basically I told him, look, I have TOS and I don't want to hear anything else because I have it. Like now I have a piece of paper saying I have TOS, so you can't tell me I don't. And he was like, okay. And uh, he just, we basically just talked. Okay. Well, just... not okay. But he, at that point, like, he really couldn't just, you know, say I didn't have it. So we started talking about, I said, like, look, I'm bedridden. I'm miserable. I need help. And he said, okay, well, I can do surgery on you. But um, I can't guarantee you that it's going to get rid of your symptoms up here. But I can probably get rid of your arm and hand pain. And at that point, I was like, whatever, I just need this to happen. I was just, I felt so back into a corner with my pain because I had been left like that for so long. I didn't even feel up to getting a second opinion, even though I, I did have a uh, something working with my insurance to do just that. I was just in so much pain. I just couldn't do it. And uh, so I ended up having surgery with him in December. So, so if I can interrupt, uh, Jen, please. You didn't think much about the surgery. You just said I got to do something. So, is that fair? I mean, how did you? How much did you think about the surgery before you agreed to it? How much did you read about it? A lot. You, you did good. I mean, I had been reading about it before I went back to him because at that point I had found a couple groups on Facebook who talked about surgery and how much it was helping people. Um. And so I kind of went to him with that agenda. And I just, I just wanted relief. The doctor who um, was gonna be my second opinion was like a two hour drive. I could barely be in a car for five minutes. Uh, Stanford is like 35 minutes away from my house. And this is a Stanford doctor. Stanford is, you know, highly acclaimed. So I thought, well, I'm in good hands here. But I wasn't. So when, uh, when was the surgery approximately? December 11th of 2017. That's not approximate. <laughs> December 11th, 2017. You don't forget those kind of dates. Okay. Well, uh, let's tell us the next chapter of what happened, please. About the surgery and stuff? Yeah. Okay. So I had surgery and um, they went in. The, the, the um, Stanford doctor went in here and that's called supraclavicular. So he went in here and he uh, removed my first rib 
or at least he said he did, and did a scalenectomy, which involves removing the anterior and middle scaling. Um, after my surgery, like immediately after, my pain was so much worse, which, you know, you expect it to be because you just had surgery. But I had like, just my pain was way worse. My nerve pain was way worse. Everything was really bad. Um, about nine days after my surgery, I was really sick. I, I don't know if it was a stomach flu or, you know, just kind of a result of all the anesthesia and all of the fentanyl and stuff they had to give me at the hospital. But I was really sick. Um, I ended up in the ER twice because I couldn't keep anything down. I couldn't keep medicine, water, and I was scared. And so the second time I went to the ER, I went to Stanford because I said, I wanna see my doctor. I need to know what's going on. And I was so terrified for my life at this point. Um, couldn't keep any meds down. They gave me some Dilaudid in the ER, which barely shaved off any of the pain at that point. Um, and in comes my doctor and he said, I said, I told him what was going on. Oh, you look fine. I said, well, he's like, you look great for not being on any pain meds. You must be doing okay. And I said, first of all, I'm on Dilaudid. And what do you want me to like, he's crawling up the wall. Like I, he said, you're fine. Go home, watch Netflix, just chill out. Act like you have the flu, you're gonna be fine. See you later. Super dismissive. Um, so I went home and I, you know, I was having so much pain. I had to call the clinic several times to get refills on my medication. They kept telling me like, you shouldn't be having this kind of pain. You shouldn't be needing this much medication. But, you know, it's like it wasn't a red flag to them that something was wrong. It was like, oh, I must be a pill seeker or something. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. Exactly. You shouldn't. So I had a three month follow up. And I went in there with the agenda of let's figure out what's going on. Let's do some imaging. Like, let's see what we can figure out. I wasn't going in there to be angry or upset with the doctor. Um, he said, we're not doing any imaging. Uh, you're fine. I did a surgery on you that was successful. It just didn't help your symptoms. I don't know what that means. Um, and then he started screaming at me. Um, it, it was just a really bad appointment. He screamed at me. He yelled at me. He like berated me. He bullied me. I so was sorry. hyperventilating. I had a panic attack after. It was terrible. And he blamed everything on me. And when I left, he wrote, uh, Jen is a mental patient who's a pill seeker. So at that point, I said, well, I'm not going back to him. So I decided to get a second opinion. Wow. That's, that's the understatement of the year. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear that that happened to you. Uh, obviously, we're trained to get past our personal issues. Um, the surgery, as you said, writing down the surgery was successful. How do you define that if the symptoms didn't go away? You know, what the patient expired, but the surgery was successful. I got, I, I build successfully, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really... Uh, Difficult for me to hear, especially because I, I know how much pain you and other TOS patients go through. And, um, you know, I, I guess he really wasn't convinced you had TOS. So on he, wasn't. Top of, he know, didn't say that. He said, oh, you must not have had TOS if my surgery didn't work for you. OK. So so he didn't uh, say I'll refer you to a different type of doctor to address the pain at that point. He said you should go to pain management. OK. And he did refer me to Stanford Pain Management. Um, you know, I went to that place several times and they just wanted to give me antidepressants. I kept telling them I was having all this pain from TOS. They didn't believe me. Um, it just, I kept leaving like in tears and upset and angry. And I just, this, I'm not going back there. They weren't listening. Um, but luckily, I was able to get a second opinion. My insurance finally came through. Um, and I went to see Dr. Humphreys up at UC Davis. Dr. Misty Humphreys. Dr. Misty Humphreys. 
who's an amazing person, an amazing surgeon, and just a very compassionate doctor. She really cares, and she truly wants her patients to get better. And if they don't, like she's cried with me before. She's she's just incredible. And like to compare it from the first doctor, night and day. So when I went to see her, she said, I don't really know what's going on with you, but let's do an x-ray. And what she saw was that Dr. Lee had only removed half of my rib. Why, I don't know. In the report, he said he removed the full rib. She said, okay, well, we need to get that out of there. So I think you need to redo surgery. And so... And about when was this? The surgery? This was about eight months after my first... December, December of 2017, December 11, 2017. And then it was about eight months after that. Yeah, it was around... Uh, I can't, you know, it's funny. I can't remember the date that, of this. That's okay. So eight years. months gives us a time frame. Right. Uh, you're struggling through all that. Dr. Humphrey said it looks like there's too much rib in there and went back in. Is that correct? Yeah. So she went back in. She went trans auxiliary, which is through the armpit. Hmm. Because the idea at that point was, you know, you have half a rib left. Once we get that out, you should feel better. So she went in, removed the rib. And it did, I like, when I woke up from my first surgery, I had a lot of ulnar pain on the back of my elbow that I hadn't had before that never went away. When I woke up from my second surgery, that was gone. Nice. So I could tell that like she had decompressed things. Um, and I, I felt better, I did physical therapy, but at about 10 weeks, um, I started feeling worse again. But I still stuck with the physical therapy. I found a really good person up in San Francisco. Her name is Liz Carpelli. And she, I went to her for a, a year after my second surgery. Just keep trying she to knows, get better. She knows TOS, by the way. Yeah. She's not just a physical therapist. She's a physical therapist who's very aware of TOS. Has a yes. lot of experience. Do you know her? a big difference. I, I know of her and I've never met her directly. I know that she, she works with Dr. Newkirk a lot, who's up in Marin. Yes. And several yes. of the other doctors that we work with in the area. Um, can I ask you, did Dr. Humphreys make any comments after she did surgery? Did she find anything um, that she thought would be helpful during the surgery? Yes. So she told me that when she went in there, what she found was that the inferior trunk of my brachial plexus had just been rubbing and scraping on that cut piece of bone every time I moved my arm. And so that's why I was having so much pain. And uh, so she took the rib out and cleared that up, but I had tons of scar tissue on my nerves and obviously trauma. Yeah, tons of scar tissue from the first surgery or after Dr. Humphrey's surgery? From the first. Okay. Yeah. yeah that happens. Um, just to add in for all our listeners, uh, we do know that um, there are different approaches. Uh, you had brought up, Jen, that uh, Dr. Humphreys took the transaxillary approach. Uh, your first doctor, the vascular surgeon at Stanford, had used a supraclavicular approach over the clavicle. Dr. Humphreys used a different approach going through the underarm, axillary, transaxillary. And she was smart to do that. doesn't surprise me at all because a lot of the vascular surgeons who, who take a more um, radical approach and try to remove everything that's in there that could be affecting the plexus, Afterwards, there'll be a lot of scar tissue because a lot has been disrupted. So a lot of these people don't like redos, a redo of a previous surgery because there's so much scar tissue. There's right. no normal tissue plane. It's hard to tease things out. It's a difficult surgery. So Dr. Humphreys tried a different approach to avoid the scar tissue as much as possible. But it's not surprising to hear that there was scar tissue in there from the first surgery. That's one of the issues you deal with if you take a more aggressive approach. Right. Um, so now you, you've gotten the surgery. She found some of the issues she thought were explaining symptoms. You woke up feeling better. Um, you went to see Liz Scarpelli for a year, did you say, in San Francisco, the physical therapist? Correct. And I will say, too, the trans auxiliary approach is a million times easier to recover from than the supraclavicular because when they go in here, it's described like going through a layer cake. They have to move all these things out of the way, your muscles and all this, and things when they put you back together, it's a constant spasming up here. And I could like barely move my neck after that first surgery. After the trans auxiliary, you don't have any of that. 
So, so there, there are advantages and disadvantages to each. I'll yeah. just say that. And of course, yeah. every person and every procedure is a little bit different. Right. Even if you take five surgeons who do the supraclavicular approach, they can do it in somewhat different ways. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, a sample size of one, just your case, I think we should be cautious. Um, you, you know, we, we want to be cautious about w which was the best approach. Maybe if Dr. Humphrey saw you first, she might have taken a different approach, superclavicular. <clears throat> and, you know, maybe she wouldn't have done it as radically. Maybe she would have done it differently. It, it's a little hard for us to know. So um, I'll just caution for all our viewers that it, there are many variables here. It's not an easy decision. Definitely. And, you know, you want to see a top doctor who's going to make those decisions with you mm -hmm. based on your specific case not just who's going to stamp the same surgery on everybody. You know, it's it's like you said, it's different for everybody and this isn't necessary for everybody. I, I will also point out, and I've said this before on our live streams, Dr. Humphreys, who is, um, you know, her personality is tremendous. She's very smart. She's very caring about her patients, very dedicated. She's one of the few people I know who will take different approaches. A lot of TUS surgeons have their one approach that they've perfected. They do it all the time. And they'll say, I've been doing this for 20 years or 30 years. Why should I change? Right. That's what I'm good at. But Dr. Humphreys has more than one approach. And um, we haven't done many patients together. We, we do some. And she will use the imaging along with her clinical judgment to say, maybe I need to take this approach or the other approach. That's a pretty big deal for me because yeah. TOS is so varied. It's different in different people. There That's is no amazing. one TOS. We know no. this from 200 years of history in the literature. So anybody now who's turned TUS into one disease with one approach, I think you're going to find some patients won't respond as well to that. So, yeah, nothing but good things to say about Dr. Humphreys. And I'm not surprised that she started solving the, the issue. So, yeah. so I'm interrupting her story now. We'll go back to seeing uh, Liz Scarpelli. Did the physical therapy she did make a difference for you, do you believe? Um. It, well, I got my range of motion back. That took about eight months, which was cra a crazy long time. Um, but it, you know, just what it was. Um, she did help me build a little bit of strength, but I had to back off that pretty quickly because my body just wasn't ready. But she, you know, she really listened to me and she wouldn't push. You know, she understands TOS that you don't push through pain, you don't, you know, if something hurts, she taught me to kind of stretch to you feel it and then back off a little. And she taught me how to kind of listen to my body. So I did learn a lot from her. Yeah. By the way, I hope you've seen at the bottom of the screen, we have uh, Patrick who's been on there uh, commenting and uh, who's mentioned he follows you on Instagram and is following your story with great interest. Oh, I see that now. I'm sorry, I was looking at the other comments. Oh, hi, Patrick. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. And Patrick, I don't know. I'll just mention this um, because I know that um, we've already talked about this earlier, not on here, but I spoke with Dr. Warden about it. Um, I do a uh, TOS support and awareness group on Clubhouse every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. There it is. And then also there's my Instagram handle if anybody wants to find me. I'm always here to talk if you want to send me messages, if you have questions. I'm, I just want so to help. I can vouch for Jen's clubhouse. Uh, she runs this really nice, in a nice manner, has a lot of different people with different viewpoints. And she just kind of emcees or moderates the whole thing and lets people share. I've been Thank lucky you. enough to participate a few times in uh, the patients on there are very well informed and it's just a very positive group that I think is very educational. So if you can, if anybody's watching and they want to join a clubhouse, which is just an audio only meeting, it's very easy to participate. Look up, look up Jen. Yeah, you can do it for it right in bed, which works out right with chronic pain, you know, so you don't have to worry about how you look or feel. You can just listen or you can talk. There's throw, all kinds throw of in your earbuds and just lay there and mm -hmm. Don't have to move anything except your ears. Yeah. So again, th thank you, Patrick. We really appreciate you listening. So now you've you've gone through the surgery with uh, Misty Humphreys, and you've been with Liz Scarpelli doing physical therapy. And then what was the next transition for you? 
Yes, and I apologize, I have a mint in my mouth because all these medications make my mouth so dry when I'm talking. No trouble. Um, what was the, you said what was next for me? What was the, what was the next stage after uh, about a year after surgery and going through physical therapy for a year with Liz Scarpelli? What happened after that? Well, so I stopped going to physical therapy because basically we got to a point where we realized there's really not much more she can do um, because my pain was so high. She mentioned that she thought maybe I had CRPS, um, which is, for those of you who don't know, it's complex regional pain syndrome. And um, I just want to get a definition because I have a really good quick definition of it. It's a rare neuroinflammatory disease that affects the central nervous system, causing the nerves to misfire, sending constant and intense pain signals to the brain. So it's basically like your central nervous system just goes insane and just is sending the signals constant, 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 sending them, even if nothing is wrong in your body. So she said, I think you might have that. But of course, like, I didn't want to hear that. CRPS is probably the worst thing you can have. It's considered the most painful condition in the world. Um, it's nicknamed the suicide disease. So every time I was told you might have this, I was like, no, nope, I'm going to run away from that. Um, so after I stopped doing PT, I found a really great pain, excuse me, pain management doctor at UC Davis that Dr. Humphreys referred me to. And his name is Dr. Charles DeMesa. He knows a lot about TOS and um, he's really great to you. Like he listens, he wants to help. He's, he's, you know, down to go on the journey with you and try this, try that. So, you know, that's what we kind of started doing. I tried uh, Botox on my left side, which made everything worse. Um, he tried doing hydro dissection, which is kind of, can you explain that Dr. Gordon? You probably can sure. better than I can. Sure. So. Um after TOS surgery, a lot of patients will get new inflammatory tissue around the brachial plexus. Uh, you know how if you cut your thumb, right, it'll get swollen and it'll be swollen for a while, beyond the first day. It's the body's response to things that it sends in a lot of new cells to build up blood vessels and bring in the right types of cells to do all the repairs. And so this kind of tissue is called granulation tissue, which eventually can turn into solid fibrous tissue or scar tissue. Okay. We see it in post-operative patients of the spine as a, an anti-parallel to you. When you had symptoms after surgery and you didn't get imaging, Jen, I can't tell you how many times in a regular shift of radiology, I will get a CAT scan or an MRI of a lumbar spine or a cervical spine because the surgeon says the patient has new or persistent symptoms. Let's do a post-op study and see what's happening. So that's kind of de rigueur. It just doesn't make sense. The TOS world is crazy as it is, but that's another one of my pet peeves, and I think it's based on logic and fact. So, yeah, what, you know, what, what thinking back is, to it, like if I if I would have known you at that time, <laughs> and Doctor Humphreys would have known, we could have. Hopefully, we would have helped smooth this. I, I yeah. So, yeah. what happens around the brachial plexus after surgery, especially if the doctor does what's called an aggressive neurolysis, scraping down the plexus to remove any scar tissue? It can yeah. initiate a whole new cycle of inflammation. So uh, hydrodissection is one way to address that. It's where you take a needle and under ultrasound, usually, yes. you can get the needle right up to the edge of the nerves and you start slowly injecting um, liquid. It can be concentrated dextrose. Some people will use uh, pl uh, platelets, uh, concentrated platelets or amniotic fluid. There are a lot of people working with these biologics because they believe they inject you know, amniotic fluid or stem cells that the body can start a new healing process. Interesting. But the idea is to separate hydrodissection with this liquid to get the nerves freed up from their surrounding scar tissue so they can glide more smoothly. That's the idea. Right. There's not a lot of literature on it to support it, I can tell you, but uh, the concept is interesting. So sorry, I'm just grabbing a nice pack here. Okay. Yeah, so he tried that on me, and um, I didn't get any relief from it, unfortunately. He was pretty hopeful, but the good thing that came out of all that, everybody with TOS who's watching already knows, pillows are life. 
We have a lot of pillows as a TOS uh, patient. So we tried all that stuff. Um, and while he was doing the ultrasound for the uh, hydrodissection, he looked up here behind my clavicle and he saw a huge mass of scar tissue. Um, he sent that to Dr. Humphreys and um, she looked at it and, and so basically said like, look, um, we can go in and we can do a surgery, but it's gonna be really risky. You know, you could have nerve damage or could, you could get worse. She wasn't promising me anything. Um, and that's what I love about her too, is her honesty. She's not gonna say, oh, I'm gonna fix you. You're gonna get better. If she doesn't believe that, she's not gonna say it. Um, so finally, like after, this was two years after my second surgery, I was back to being bedridden, couldn't leave my house. I was like this for about three and a half years. I couldn't, I was like basically bedridden and it was awful. So I decided, you know what, I can't live like this. Let's do a third surgery. So she went in super super clavicular and she basically did what you just described, Dr. Ward, in the brachial plexus neuralysis, where she scraped off a bunch of scar tissue. She found that there was a mass in there that was entrapping all of my nerve roots and compressing all of my nerves. Um, that recovery was really, really tough. There was outrageous nerve pain like I've never had before um, for about 10 weeks that I, and I couldn't get my pain under control. It was really tough. Um, but around July, February of this year, I started it, So I should say this, I woke up from that surgery weirdly with complete range of motion and full function and use of my arm and hand, which is extremely rare. I don't know how I got lucky, but I did. So I didn't really, we, like Dr. Humphreys and I agreed, I was in too much pain to go to PT. My range of motion was fine. So I didn't do PT after this. Um, and then around January, January, February of this year, I really started to notice an improvement in the way I was feeling. And I started to regain, you know, function and use back into my arm and hands. I even have a tiny bit of muscle. It's very small, but it's bigger than it used to be. Um, unfortunately, last year I was also diagnosed with CRPS. So I do have that and I have it mainly kind of in this area. And then I have flares that go down in my arm and hand. Um, so, but I, ha I do have a lot more function and I can finally after three surgeries and three and a half years say, I am glad I did the surgeries. Applause for Dr. Humphreys. Big time. Yeah. And he's not the kind of surgeon who like does the surgery and dumps you. I still, you know, email her. I emailed her what last week. So she's, She's in for the long run, you know? That's great to hear and not surprising at all. Yeah. So that brings us up to the present day. How do you feel about your future for the next six months or two years? Well, so while I have gotten better from TOS, I do feel like my CRPS has gotten worse. So, and I believe I've had like a major spread down into my arm. So it's hard for me to assess like the TOS at this point. I like I'm still very disabled by the pain. I can't be in a car without excruciating pain. The vibration is just horrible. You can't be um, a passenger in a car? No. I definitely I haven't driven in a long time. I don't even know how that would feel. But being a passenger in a car, I can, but I have to have a lot of pillows, you know, beside me, behind me. Sometimes I wear a neck brace. Sometimes it's a neck pillow, just depending on where I'm at. Yeah. Um, so it's not fun, but I can walk places. And I live in a place where, you know, there's a lot of walkable places. I can walk to the ocean stores. So I do that and I can ride my recumbent bike. I can use my left, left hand and arm for all kinds. You know, I don't, in my mind, I'm not not using it anymore. It's just back to being part of my body. Awesome. I do, you know, protect it still, but I use it. Yeah. So that's, that's a great thing. You know, I can, I can, um, I can repot my plants. 
I can pick up my kittens. They probably weigh like three or four pounds. I can, you know, use my phone. I couldn't even hold a pencil before. So your kittens are very cute and you had cute <laughs> names for them. Yeah, they're both black kitties and their names Snowball and Marshmallow. And they're cute for a good reason because they are crazy. <laughs> so that's why they're cute. So you won't throw them out the window. But I love them. Can be therapeutic. I think yes, they, therapeutic. They, they are. They make me laugh a lot. These are great. My kids, uh, my two kids grew up with cats and they've learned a lot about how to uh, interpret body language because cats don't say anything, but they say a lot. If you look mm -hmm. at them. So if you could do things differently, if you could have made different decisions at certain points over the past several years, can you think of the couple of major ones you might have reconsidered or approached differently? This is a tough question for me because I don't, I try, I try not to let myself think about it too much because understand. Yeah. Like I don't want to live in the past. I don't want to say I should have done this. I should have done that. I've done a lot of that. Um, but what I would say is I would have gotten to Dr. Humphreys first. I would have gotten a second opinion um, and going to her and it would have been a very obvious choice to me that she would have been the one to go to based on my interactions. Um, I mean, that's a huge one. I also would not have gone to that chiropractor in the beginning. I think she was doing manipulations and things that were really making me worse. So I would have not gone to her either. It's to me, the recommendations I make for people are just go to a doctor who really knows their stuff. And you might have to travel to see that person, but it's worth it. Like this is your life. And once you have surgery, you cannot undo that. So you just want to be with someone who really knows what they're doing. That's my number one thing that I would do over. We get a lot of questions from patients about, um, is this surgeon good? Is that surgeon good? And you always, always, we encourage as strong as we can a second opinion. Yes. I know in your case, and in many other cases I've dealt with, Jan, quite honestly, people have been so much in pain that they just they had to make a decision and go forward. And especially you're a proactive person. You want to get it fixed and you want to get it fixed now. Yeah, that's yeah. good, but that's bad. You know, um, I know a few people have made decisions that really um, didn't turn out as well as they wanted because they hunted down a solution and they just uh, took the plunge, I guess. Yeah, yeah. you're so you're desperate. desperate. Yeah. You're just desperate. I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we hear these stories. But yeah, but but Dr. Humphreys would agree, you know, she she's great. We've heard good good things from her patients. And I can tell you in a professional relationship with her, she's free of ego. She's confident. She's smart, but doesn't stop her from learning more, asking yep, yep. questions. And so uh, she's, you know, the type of personality we need in this field. Because I agree. it is it is a tough disease. And I think there's a lot of different patients with TOS. So I think there's a lot of different kinds of disease in there. And we need to appreciate the subtle differences. Um, yeah. And something I also would like to say is I, I feel like if this were more understood, if more physical therapists truly knew how to treat this condition. Uh, we lost maybe... connection. Sorry. Oh, you're back. We lost. Great. What were you saying? I was saying that if, if there were more physical therapists who really understood this condition, you know, maybe more people could get better with physical therapy. And, you know, who knows? My hope is that we can raise enough awareness about this condition that people kind of know how to advocate for themselves because you know, you can kind of get lost in the system, especially if it's something rare. Well, we agree. I don't think it's that rare. I agree right. also with what you said before, that there are various levels of TOS starting pretty minimal. And that's when you want to basically know what it is and stop doing what you're doing that's causing it. Right. Mm -hmm. We also agree that there's a lot of conservative therapy that can work if we catch it early enough. Yes. And if it's treated by the right physical therapist. Um, I will say that there have been, I, I recorded like 25 or 26 different syndromes from 1818, the first description of it, until 1956. There are a lot of famous doctors in the field of medicine who found different maneuvers that provoked the symptoms mm -hmm. and named it differently. And then in 1956, a physical therapist, he hadn't even graduated, I believe he was still a resident, 
uh, Pete, R.M. Pete, P-E-E-T. He said, um, look, you know, I've, I've read about this. It's very complex. All the anatomy is complex. It's different in different people. There's so many different syndromes. It makes your head spin. So let's just all lump it together and call it thoracic outlet syndrome. And between those two sentences, I'm like, how did you get from A to B? Right. And so unfortunately, I think unwinding it, it's not just all thoracic outlet syndrome. I can tell you from imaging, I see different things on different patients. And I'm always bugging my referring doctors and saying, can we talk? I just got a text while we're doing this from one of the docs I bugged earlier today. And I'm going to let him know what I see in this patient that's not in other patients. And uh, if he has any questions or any decisions that I can help contribute to, because it's not my patient, I'm not making the big decisions, but I'm a consultant. So if I can help with that, you know, again, different patients have different problems. I don't yeah. think they all need to have a surgery where you go in and take everything out. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's one surgery for all TOS patients. It's my experience. I'm trained in two different specialties, but not surgery. So take it with a grain of salt. But I work with a lot of surgeons and a lot of patients. Yeah, you've, and, seen, you've seen a lot of outcomes. And we have. And, and we, we, we think there's a lot of room for improvement. So... I want to ask you one more question. It's a bigger question. Okay. What, okay. Do, what do you think we need to change in the system, quote unquote, that can make things better in the future for patients finding TOS to start with and then navigating their way through this minefield? Hmm. Well, I mean, gosh, the whole system is just so messy. I guess the advice that I, I would give, which maybe isn't your question, but you really, really have to be your own advocate. You have to push, you have to, you know, if you just wait for things to go and people to make appointments and wait for your doctor to figure things out, you're just gonna be kind of waiting. So you really, I feel like you really kind of have to be up people's butts a little bit. And I don't know if this is making sense, but you kind of have to keep fighting and keep pushing and keep asking, I want to see this doctor. I want to have this test done. I want to try this. I want to try this physical therapy. I want to go see this person. Um, how the medical system could do that better would be just being more educated about these, these conditions. That way, you know, when I go to my primary and I say, I think I may have this COS, she says, boom, here you go. Um, so there are doctors, uh, and I say this all the time, the level of knowledge of TOS throughout all doctors is from here to here. Yes. So you can run into a doctor, you and other patients out there, who says, yeah, I, you know, you don't have a cervical rib, so you can't have TOS. That's just obviously not true, no. but I'm not blaming somebody. I, I learned about TOS in medical school with this many minutes, and most people I know had nothing about it in medical school. It's been fascinating for me intellectually, but as a human being, you know, we deal with people like Jen and other people who are amazing people, gone out of their way, and, you know, some do better than others, some do worse than others. So the reason I ask about the system is one of the things you kind of addressed obliquely, which is awareness. How do people first even search for the term thoracic outlet syndrome? Right. Yeah, and I mean, there, there are physical ex exams that can be done, you know, to see, like the ruse and the Addison's test. So I feel like, yeah, it's, it's awareness, it's more education. Um, there's actually a girl in my clubhouse group who is a medical student, and they just went over to TOS and she said it was, yeah, like, and you're done talking about it. It's just like huh. one page that most people probably skip, you know? And it should be maybe 20 pages. It's important and it's not rare. And the more like we live in a society that's like go, go, go and constant repetition, it's causing all these problems. And we live in a society with a whole lot of devices now. Yeah, we do. Yeah, you're looking down all the time. And... Now, but people with jobs like yours with our arms in front of them all the time Okay, getting into weird positions as you work on things. Yeah. Uh, like hairstylists, sonographers get these symptoms that I have yet to see somebody call TOS, but in the radiology literature, they'll talk about sonographers having upper extremity pain syndromes. Mm. So lots of people in the world who do strange things. UPS workers are always reaching up. Painters of houses we've seen. So uh, some of it's occupational and some of it is 
recreational with all these things. We curl up on the couch and we hold our iPad in a weird direction, right? Right. And we do it for hours at a time while we're playing a game. So I, I think there are varying degrees of TOS, and I think it's more common than is recognized. Definitely. Uh, some, some famous athletes have been diagnosed, and uh, I keep hoping that one of those will break out where the mainstream, everybody will say, I've heard of TOS because I know the Matt Harvey story or whatever. I know, me too. But then because you get doctors who aren't aware either, right? Right. Yeah. You know, there's, there's been basketball players, pitchers, you know, swimmers get this. And I can tell you just, I have it on both sides. And the difference in my sides, like my right side is I use Botox on, I get Botox injections, but even without those, it's really not as symptomatic unless I really irritate it. And whereas my left side, it's just constant. So there's just such a big variation, like you said. And mm -hmm. I think that the TOS that's minor can definitely be corrected with physical therapy mm -hmm. if you're going to the right person. And if you address it soon enough. If you, that's which absolutely is, the, really important. Which is and why the awareness that people just find that term and then search on a little bit. Like, yeah, you, we have a ton of patients who say once took a while, but once I heard about TOS and I searched on it, I said, that's me. Yeah. But it can't happen too late. What about the access we have to tools like social media now? Well, I think it's great. Um, I remember when I met the first person, somebody reached out to me on Instagram who had TOS and I'd never met anybody else with it. And it just was amazing to feel like, oh my God, I'm not alone. I'm not, I'm not crazy. Like this is, somebody else has this. And then I started finding so many more people it really can bring us together. And it's also a great way to provide information. Like what doctor do you go to? I live here. Is there a physical therapist near me? So, you know, we all try to come together and help each other um, on, on, on social media. And I think it's a wonderful tool for that. Do you have uh, recommended places on social media that you go to besides your great clubhouse? Uh, well, uh, your, the toseducation.org is a great site. Um, there's tons of information on there. If, if you guys haven't gone, you definitely should check it out. I checked it out and I was kind of blown away at how much information there was. This is run by Herb Rep, toseducation.org. Yeah. You know, and we're, we're very lucky to have some of the doctors we've had on and now a great patient who's very well spoken. Thank really you. Helps. How about your Instagram? Do you mind if people contact you on Instagram? Oh, I would love that. Yeah, I'm here. I'm I'm. Send me a message. I would love to connect with people. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Lioness with TOS. Lioness with TOS with underscores. Yep, that's me. And uh, it's a public page. So I just, I really love connecting with people, helping people. I, I feel like I get at least somebody on a weekly basis coming to me and they're, you know, spinning. They don't know what to do. And it's just, you know, it's so nice to be able to kind of help people go find a path, find a direction. Because I know like when I was going through this, I didn't have that, you know? So I, I really think it's so important to have support. Um, it's huge. I, I personally would highly recommend anybody who's watching this, reach out to Jen on Instagram and connect. She, she knows a lot, she's been through a lot, but she, she knows a lot of resources and she's very positive. Thank you, I try. Did you see the comment below, by the way, from Julian in Australia? No. At the bottom of the screen, it says, wow, so remarkable. How oh. important. You see it now? Yes. So that's a very nice uh, and, and pertinent comment. Yes. I think that, you know, the level of care that a physician like uh, Misty Humphreys puts into her patients uh, it's, it's pretty important because the disease isn't just a take an aspirin and go home and you'll be better type of disease. No. So I do see a question. You mentioned that symptoms became worse with your physical therapist. Can you speak more to that? Um, well, he, it's hard. I, you know, he was doing things. Um, first of all, he, he himself said that he didn't think I had it, but he was, He just was doing, having me do exercises that were hurting me. He was pushing me too hard. Um, and then anybody who says like, I don't think you have TOS, 
it's just they're automatically dismissing you. Um, I also had a physical therapist tell me, don't let pain take up so much space in your life, Jen, as if this is my fault. Um, he just pushed me too hard. And at that time, I didn't really know how to stand up for myself. I've learned, you know, through, through the process of doing all this stuff. But really, if something is hurting you, speak up because you're the only one who knows your body. Um, and if you feel like a physical therapist isn't helping you, stop going and try to find someone else because they can really make your symptoms worse. I hope that helps with the question. So your first therapist um, was at Stanford and uh, you didn't feel they're very experienced in TOS. No. So I would recommend also when you call to make your appointment for physical therapy, say like, look, I have TOS and I need a person who really understands my condition. Hopefully they will listen to you because what I get told is, oh, we're all trained on that. But then you know, actually you get in there and they kind of don't really know. It's best if you can get a personal recommendation from somebody. Um, I feel like that's the best way to find a physical therapist, which is hard. Yeah, you don't want a response like TOS? Uh, sure, sure, why not? Right. Yeah. Um, oh, you mentioned something before about trying to strengthen. I think Steve Talikowski, who trained for years with Peter Edgelow and carries on his torch, uh, who's spoken on this toseducation.org a few times. Yeah. Uh, he, he avoids strength. I can't hear you. Hello, hello. There we go. There we go. All right. <laughs> So, uh, so Steve uh, talks about how he avoids strengthening for long periods of time yeah, yeah. until everything else is stabilized. It's really critical, he believes. Otherwise, you'll just end up inflaming everything all over again. I agree 100%. Yeah, so we and anybody out there who needs a good physical therapist, we can connect you with Steve Talikowski. Uh, Jen, you had mentioned Liz Scarpelli in San Francisco has a very good reputation. And I just learned of a couple new ones in uh, the North Bay. Marine oh, County. great. Great and uh, Oakland, and I'm going to be talking with those people and kind of feeling out their knowledge of TOS and their interest in dealing with TOS patients. So That's hopefully great, great. either through these people or through their contacts in other states, we can help more patients get to physical therapists who really know TOS. So I, I agree with you completely. Don't just see a physical therapist that can make things worse. See yeah. somebody who's really specialized. Um, somebody, somebody had a question, question. And I, think I think it was, it was like, like how, how to, to find, find the good, good. How do you find a physician that cares for two patients? There it is. So Jamie okay. from Chicago. So uh, Jamie, uh, what I always recommend first is to go onto Facebook. There is a really large group for TOS. Join that group. They have in the file section a list of all the different specialists. You could also just say a comment. Say, hi, I'm Jamie. I live in blank. Can you guys Can you tell guys me tell who me the nearest TOS specialist to me is? is. That's my recommendation. My Those groups are really great, great to kind of help you get your footing, find a doctor to kind of start your journey, you know, you know support. support. Um, um, and then, and you, can then always, you can always, you can always come to our clubhouse as well. But the Facebook is a great place to start for finding the TOS specialists. Because that's really important. And you can feel free to contact us through the TOS MRI website. We know lots of docs around the country, and we will email you back with a list of people in your area. I would also advise, uh, pertinent to what Jen said about getting a second opinion, even if you have to travel, it's often worth it to see a real TOS specialist rather than just a doc who's close to you. It's yeah, a serious yeah. disease. You don't want it to be diagnosed and treated correctly. And so you want to see somebody experienced. If there isn't somebody immediately near you, it's usually worth a trip, especially nowadays with video consults. Some docs can talk to you or actually see you and give you a basic idea to start with. So contact us, tosmri.com, and we can help you find docs as well. That's great. I didn't, I didn't realize you guys had a list. I'll tell everybody about that. We do. And, and I know the, the two large Facebook groups you talk about, and I think those are good places for people to get the lay of the land. Yes, I yes. think it's worth it, you know, advising also that these are patients only. These uh, yes, yes. 
Facebook groups. So uh, people have lots of different opinions. Um, look, I mentioned, you know, there are doctors who don't know everything and maybe they think they do. And it happens when people in all walks of life. So keep grains of salt with you as you, as you read through some of this. Absolutely. You know, they're, they're they're not doctors, they can't give you medical advice, they can't tell you if you have TOS or not, but they can help to guide you. Um, and like Dr. Worden said, you know, proceed with caution, take it with a grain of salt, and, and you know, there's a lot of opinions, so. But it is a really good place to start. Yeah, a lot of exposure to ideas, to experiences. And, and yeah, you should always just verify things. Use your common sense, verify. Like I said, if you see a, a surgeon and you end up getting a second opinion, but go back to the first surgeon, that's better than not ever getting the second opinion at all. Absolutely. You'll say, you'll say I've done my due diligence. I think the first surgeon is better if yeah, you yeah. should be in that situation. Yeah. Great. Yeah, um, I thought um, Haley, Haley had a Haley question. Had a question. Can, Can you put that back up? up? There are no silly questions, questions, first of all. Let's see, so what, are what, what are the most common, common symptoms, symptoms for TOS? This is all new to me. I would, I would say, say the, the most, most common, common symptoms, symptoms are, are you know, nerve pain, pain down the arm and hand, hand. Um, pain in, in your face, in your, in your kind of pec area, area, maybe in your, in your, your armpit, armpit. Um, trap, trap, pain, tightness, tightness neck, neck pain, pain um, migraines. migraines. Those, Those are kind of common. common. Would you agree, Dr. Worden? Yeah, I think that what you've pointed out are a bunch of non-specific things. Lots of people get headaches, right? Yeah. Lots yeah. of people get neck pain. That's one of the challenges with TOS. Um, well, headaches headache and migraines are very different. different. Yep, nonetheless. And I think migraines right, right. are associated with TOS as well for a lot yeah, of reasons. Yeah. But what I would say is there is no one pathognomonic sign. There is no one symptom that screams TOS. Right, right. Instead, if it's complex, if more than one nerve root is involved, let's say you have symptoms radiating down both arms, it could be a herniated disc in the middle, mm -hmm. but it can be TOS. It commonly right, is right. TOS. If you have, when your doctor sees you, a C6 nerve root and a C7 nerve root and a C8 nerve root, anything that involves more than one nerve root on your doctor's exam should raise the specter of TOS. If you had a car accident with a neck injury, Okay, whiplash is just local pain. Anything radiating down one or both arms, you should be thinking TOS. Any of these complex of symptoms, as Jen mentioned, pain radiating down the arm with neck pain, with headache. Once it starts getting multifactorial and complex, you can be thinking about TOS. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. It's, it's, it's not, not just going to be one, one thing. thing. It's going to be a few. And let's combine it with some other things. Does it get worse when you brush your hair, when you brush your teeth? Right, right. Right. When you throw your baby up in the air and catch it again. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. When you drive a car, when you hold the phone up for a while. So if those things exacerbate it, you should be thinking TOS. Right. If right. it happens at the end of a long work day where you're on a non ergonomic computer, you should be thinking TOS. Right? Yeah, and that's, and that's you know, going, going back, back, to back to kind of the whole thing about, thing about the medical system. system. That's, that's the hard, hard part, part is that, that when you go in with these things, things the, doctors the doctors aren't thinking to us because it's just so rare in their opinion that you couldn't possibly have it. Um, whereas if they were thinking, hey, maybe this might be this, let's you know have an open mind, people could move along a little quicker. That's a great point. I mean, if a doctor examines you and the doc knows what he or she is doing and they say there's a C5 and a C6 and a C7 nerve root involved, they should be thinking TOS. And unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. Right. I'll say this, neurologists in particular are very strong supporters of that true neurogenic TOS versus disputed. Yeah, they are. are. More neurologists who tend to support that concept, which is just false. So you got to be a little careful. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I had, had an experience recently with a neurologist. neurologist. He told me that um, even with my positive EMG, that, that he didn't, he didn't think, think I had true TOS. TOS. He thought I had muted TOS. So what I heard was, you don't think I have TOS because if I don't have real TOS, I have just, like, what's the definition of disputed, right? So it's just such a dismissive It's It's a word. type of nerve entrapment where I get to dismiss you. Right. There you go. 
<laughs> we have, uh, and I think I've told this story before on our live streams, but doing some medical legal work, there's a doc in San Francisco who uh, used to testify against TOS cases all the time. And I made it my job to kind of educate attorneys who tend to be pretty smart people. So one attorney questioned him and said, um, so I understand Dr. S, you are, um, you're an expert in TOS. And he said, yes, I am. And he said, uh, TOS is also pretty rare. And the guy goes, oh, it's so rare. I've seen maybe one case in my 30 years of practice. To which the lawyer said, well, then how are you an expert? There you go. <laughs> and the doctor just kind of got angry about it. So we get that a lot of course, from TOS. Course. So yeah, uh, when Jen says stand up for yourself, you know, if you get a doc like that, it says it can't be TOS because it's rare. That's crazy. I mean, you can still see rare cases. That's just someone trying to dismiss you. If you see a doc who says uh, it's not true TOS, go see another doc. Okay, that's just that should be a red flag. Um, we have another question here from Patrick. What are, what are you taught on shoulder sphere as a rehab tool for TOS? Um, Patrick, I have to say, I don't, I don't know a shoulder sphere. Is this, uh, you know, the inflatable balls that people, um, you know, use to correct their posture and lay down on it? And, and, you know, if it's generally a physical therapy tool, it's going to be beyond my range of expertise. I don't know, Jen, if you've heard about this. I don't, I don't know what a shoulder sphere is. is. Um, Patrick, Patrick, if you could elaborate, elaborate on what that is, is, that would be really helpful. helpful. And thank you so much for all your comments too. I'm, I'm yeah, just thanks, reading, reading them right now. So sorry. so sorry. So Jen, in the Bay Area, do you feel that we have a good enough supply of TOS specialists and TOS awareness? Specialists, Specialist, yes, yes, awareness, no. Um, um, I just feel, I just feel in, in general, general, there's a lacking there's awareness, awareness of TOS. TOS. So there's um, knowledge, but it's concentrated among only a few specialists. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Like, like when, when I when I met my pain management, management, uh, management uh, doctor, Dr. 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 Mesa, who works with Dr. Misty Humphreys at UC Davis, I asked him, I said, so do you guys think TOS is here? And they're like, well, not here. It's pretty much all we see. So it kind of depends on where you are. That's, you know, I found that a few places that you get a few docs who get sent everybody because the docs in the community don't want to deal with it. They view it as a complex disease with difficult patients. Difficult patients, meaning the patients want to feel better. Right. So, and they always write, patients patient complained about, about blah, 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 blah. blah. We're not we're complaining. complaining. We are we're telling, telling you what's you happening with us. us. That's why we're why here. We're here. Well, it's interesting because that's a, a medical term that ever since my first days in medical school, we were taught the chief complaint. So right, it's right. kind of a derogatory word. Yeah. But yeah. it's always been used. What's the chief complaint? Headache. What's the chief complaint? Backache. Yeah. Right, right. So a lot of docs write that down and patient complains of, and it just sounds negative, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I totally yeah. get with what it is, right, with the medical term, but it, it is it's kind of a dismissive. It's the language is kind of dismissive. Yeah. 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 yeah patient, yeah. patient presents with is much better. Stuff like that. So, I like that. So Jen, I want to say this. First of all, thank you absolutely so much for sharing. We're not only lucky to have somebody uh, willing to share, but somebody who's so well-spoken and has gone out of her way to learn about TOS. Thank you. I think it makes a huge difference. And I hope the people listening um, appreciate you as much as I do. I'm sure they do. And there are probably a whole lot of people shaking their heads yes every time you say <laughs> something because they've been through similar things. Uh, thank also, you so much. So much that uh, you know, I'm really glad about your experiences with Dr. Humphreys, and we hope that your left arm keeps improving as, as it's doing and the CRPS comes under control so you get back to normal. Thank you. Thank you. And then again, I'm gonna remind people, look for her on Instagram, look her up on Clubhouse, which has been a really great tool, I think, for people to share some knowledge. Very simple, yeah, it's just audio. And there we have the banner at the bottom. And I go on occasionally when I have the opportunity because Jen uh, loves to have me answer more difficult questions. And I guess also it stimulates some controversial questions. So we get people talking <laughs> a lot more. Hey, we have to yeah, have, have a little bit of adventure, bit of adventure right? right? It's great. You know what? If you have a, a viewpoint and someone argues with you about it, if you can hold your ground, uh, you're supporting it even more strongly. And if you change your mind because they have a better viewpoint, 
then you've advanced anyway. So exactly. You know, as long as it's not personal, if someone's saying we need to discuss this, you know, go at it. Yeah. And, yeah. and you're great at, at fostering <laughs> that on your community. So I thank think you very much. Nice. The people who there are very loyal to it. Thank All you. right. And then, of course, I'm supposed to announce that I'm going to be doing this one. The five things every patient should know about TOS Ooh. is coming up September 14th. We've done one like this before. But since I'm learning all the time from people like Jen, it'll be fresh and new, hopefully. So we encourage people to go to toseducation.org, follow their schedule for all our visits. We have some great doctors coming up who are not me. And um, maybe Jen will come on again and uh, participate with one of our other doctors, if you'd like. I would love to. Maybe we can even get Dr. Humphreys on. She'll be a great speaker. That'd be amazing. Awesome. Uh, If anybody has any other questions, share them now or forever hold your peace is that how it goes it's yeah again just to kind of return the comment i will put dr warden is is a really great doctor and also a person he comes on clubhouse donates his time um he's often says i have you know 30 minutes and he ends up staying for three hours because we're just asking him so many questions and this isn't something that he has to do um you know, you know, he's, he's not, not coming really trying, trying to sell, to sell us stuff. stuff. He's, he's, he really, really wants, wants to help the TOS, TOS community. And I and feel like, like if we could just have more people like you, Dr. Word, and that we would just really. Well, Jen, thank you. You're most kind. Uh, I do like to change the world a little bit. You know, I think anybody with kitties or kids knows about that. You know, you want to make the world a little better place. Yeah. And there are people who've been doing this longer than me, like Dr. Newkirk. Dr. Humphreys is great. And there are some people out there. We just need to connect patients with those docs. You know, Absolutely. We need, to, we need to have patients see TOS and know what it is. And, you know, I'll tell you a little quick funny story to end my viewpoint. But every time I see a baseball pitcher diagnosed with TOS, it'll be on ESPN. And I'll email the reporter and say, hey, I can give you tons of background information for free. Just let me know. But it's something we want everybody to learn about. And I've not gotten a response yet. I keep hoping that one of these times one of the reporters will get back to me. I hope so. Put out some information about TOS because people read the sports page a lot more than they read medical journals, right? Right. right. And, and I've seen they, they don't really explain TOS. TOS. They say like, oh, this guy got thoracic outlet syndrome and then he's back after X amount of months. But they don't tell you what it is. That's right. So yeah. nobody knows to put two and two together when, right, when right. they get the symptoms. All right, so thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely enlightening and a real pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you you for having me. I really really appreciate it. it. Awesome. It's been great fun. Hopefully we'll see everybody back here next time. Remember, September 14th, Dr. Scott Warden will be speaking on the five things every TOS patient should know. Hopefully you guys will know all of them by then. Jen, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Warden. Take care. Thank you, everyone. everyone.